translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Shri Prabhupada. Let me first offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is the ultimate goal of life for one bereft of all possessions in this material world and is the only meaning for one advancing in spiritual life. Thus, let me write about his magnanimous contribution of devotional service in love of God. A person in the conditioned stage of material existence is in an atmosphere help of helplessness. But the conditioned soul under the illusion of maya or the external energy thinks that he is completely protected by his country, society, friendship and love not knowing that at the time of death none of these can save him. The laws of material nature are so strong that none of our material positions can save us from the cruel hands of death. In the Bhagavad Gita 39 it, it is stated Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadhi Dukkha Doshan Darshanam One who is actually advancing must always consider the four principles of miserable life namely birth, death, old age and disease. One cannot be saved from all these miseries unless he takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is therefore the only shelter for all conditioned souls. An intelligent person therefore does not put his faith in any material possessions but completely takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Such a person is called Akinchana or one who does not possess anything in this material world. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is also known as Akinchana Gochara. For he can ach be achieved by a person who does not put his faith in material possessions. Therefore, for the fully surrendered soul who has no material possessions on which to depend, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the only shelter. Everyone depends on dharma, religiosity, artha, economic development, karma, sense gratification and ultimately moksha salvation. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, due to his magnanimous character, can give more than salvation. Therefore, in this verse, the words Heen Artha Dhika Sadhakam indicate that although by material estimation, salvation is of a quality superior to the inferior interests of religiosity, economic development and sense gratification. Above salvation, there is the position of devotional service. <coughs> and transcendental love for the Supreme Personality of God. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the bestower of these, this great benediction. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Prema Pumartho Mahan. Love of Godhead is the ultimate benediction for all human beings. Sri Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, the author of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrut, therefore, first offers his respectful obeisances unto Lord, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, before describing his magnanimity in bestowing love of Godhead. Om Jnanati Mirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpataru Bhascha Kripa Sindhu Bhavachu Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna so, I'm grateful to be here with all of you today and the, when we are celebrating the auspicious appearance of Mahaprabhu. The occasion is two days later, but logistics sometimes come in the way of our celebrations. Logistics sometimes gives the opportunity to expand our celebrations. So when the festival is on a weekday, we get to celebrate on the weekend as well as a weekday. So today I'll speak on the concept of mercy. 
and how mahaprabhu manifests his mercy now this is the chaitanya charitamrita which we are discussing and the chaitanya charitamrita has a very interesting structure in how it glorifies mahaprabhu so the chaitanya charitamrita actually in one sense the sorry the the first leela the adi leela has a certain number of chapters here we have 19 chapters the actual leela begins from the 13th chapter onwards and before that till this chapter the tattva is described the various aspects of tattva and then after that in the next few chapters the vamsha the lineages are described who are the authorized followers of mahaprabhu nityananda vamsha the advaita vamsha like that so this chapter marks the transition from you could say philosophy to history so before this philosophy is being described then the historical lineages will be described that's how krishnadas kaviraj goswami described his authority in writing chaitanya charitamrita what gives him the authority to write and then from chapter 13 he'll start the past times the appearance of mahaprabhu and in this particular verse he is talking about mahaprabhu in two different ways he's glorifying him vadanyata vadanyata is the magnanimity the generosity so that magnanimity he's talking about it two ways first he says is that for those who have who have who were bereft of material possessions for those who are bereft of material possessions mahaprabhu is the shelter agatya gatim agatya means those who gati see gati in sanskrit means motion as well as destination we have motion when we want to go towards some destination but sometimes life puts us in a situation where we just feel nothing is worthwhile why should i do anything at all so agatya gatim so for those who have lost all hope in life it's not just hope in spiritual life sometimes people lose hope in material life also you know why have a job why pursue a relationship why even live at all so for those who have lost any sense of destination he becomes their destination okay. he is the he is the destination for the destination less so those who have no destination they they may feel that there's no point to live and then they will be given that point by mahaprabhu and for those who have a destination heen arthadik sadhanakam that those who have a destination for them he reveals himself as the highest destination so highest destination for those pursuing various destinations and in the purport shri prabhupad talks about the general broad destinations that people have in life that is dharma artha kama and moksha now dharma artha kama and moksha these are four broad categories of goals that people have so dharma is sometimes translated as religion but dharma also means virtue there are many people who seek virtue in life they want to live virtuous i want to be kind i want to be truthful i want to be helpful there are people who are charitable so there are some people who pursue this there are some people who pursue artha artha can simply mean money but it can also mean prosperity so prosperity can be in various things now kama can mean sensual gratification but kama can also mean satisfaction of desires now we all have various desires and when our desires are satisfied then we feel satisfied to some extent so this is satisfaction and then moksha moksha is liberation or as prabhupada uses the word salvation now ph- philosophically speaking salvation the word is used more in the christian sense and their idea is that we go to heaven 
and we stay there forever but the idea is that we are we are freed from this world so salvation or liberation whatever word you use different people may have these four goals in different ways so some people may just seek you know i want financial security i want a stable family life I, everybody wants these things but different people want these things to different degrees and when somebody doesn't get one of these or two of these or three of these they start thinking what is the point even of living so here is talking about the inclusiveness of mahaprabhu's mercy that if you if you are hopeless if you have nothing to live for mahaprabhu will become the purpose for living and if you have something to live for mahaprabhu will reveal you how there is something bigger that you can live for in this way mahaprabhu's mercy encompass can encompass everyone right from those who may be fallen those who may be goalless to those who are elevated those who are living a life of value they can find a life of greater value and not greater the, the supreme value so in that sense mercy while it can mean many things sometimes we may say oh it's my it's mercy that i got the association of the senior devotee or it's mercy that i got to go to vrindavan it's my mercy that i even came to give the god the opportunity to practice bhakti well all these are true so mercy in it can have two different senses to it mercy at one level means the opportunity to get something more than what we deserve generally mercy is the idea that it's not proportional it's not merited that it's we the opportunity to get something more than we deserve that's one aspect of mercy mm -hmm. so whatever karma we may have done in the past we may not have much spiritual interest we may not have much spiritual credits but still we get the opportunity to connect with krishna so opportunity to get more than what we deserve but mercy has another <coughs> equally important aspect and that is the the capacity to value something higher than what we would normally value something higher than what we normally value so this is actually the internal aspect of mercy so when we we all value some things in life an alcoholic for them the biggest value is a bottle of alcohol they are ready to sacrifice anything just to get something to drink Now, there was an anti alcohol video i saw that how a person can become addicted there this person is watching uh, tv with his family and on tv there is a ad it says the price of vodka has increased mm -hmm. so the son is fearfully asking his father dad will you drink less now the father says no you will eat less now <laughs> <laughs> so it is more than one's children's sustenance one thinks feeding one's own addiction that is of the greatest value so everybody has something that they value in one fascinating purport prabhupad says that everybody has some god and when you say that god what is means whatever is the locus of highest value for a person that is their god so whatever is the thing that they value the most that is their idea of god they may not literally worship that some people even do that but for some people it may be alcohol for some people it may be money for some people it may be health for some people it may be their reputation different people have different things that they value and in one sense impurity any kind of impurity is basically a misalignment between what we value and what is of value any impurity what we does is what it does is what we value so a person who is greedy they value possessions 
over everything else. They may value positions above their reputation. They may value positions above their character, above their virtues, everything. So this misalignment, every impurity, what it does is, it creates a misalignment between what we value and what is of value. And purification essentially means the realignment between what we value and what is of value. So purification is a gradual incremental process. Where uh, slowly, when we have attachments, generally every attachment means that we irrationally value something far more than its actual value. So that is the essence of attachment. There are many things are of value in life, but attachment means we value something far more than its actual value. And detachment means the willingness to let go of that. However, bhakti is not just about detachment. Bhakti is about attachment to Krishna. So there are many things of value in life. And when we are pure, that means that which is of the highest value, we accord it the highest value. So ultimately, we are souls. We have an eternal relationship with Krishna. And our relationship with Krishna is of the highest value. So when we learn to value that relationship with Krishna the highest, that is the state when we are pure. Yam labdhva cha aparam labham manyate na dikam tataha. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, when in the state of samadhi, in the state of liberated awareness, the yogi recognizes that there is no gain greater than this. So, now this process of changing what we value, it is a very gradual incremental and often laboriously painful process. But when we get mercy, that mercy can change what we value in a dramatic way. So in a dramatic way, so generally suppose somebody has a bad habit and they want to give up a habit, they want to give up alcoholism. They try, they can't give it up, they try, they can't give it up. So their intelligence may understand that, yeah, you know, this is just getting me into trouble, I want to give it up. But their mind keeps valuing. No, this is important. How can I live without it? Everything else, I'm ready to give up for it. So that change, when it happens, when they start, when they give up, give it up. That means they start a sober life, a responsible life, my job, my family, my health, I value those more. And therefore, I give this up. So generally, changing what we value requires a lot of effort. But when we get mercy, then... What happens is, the, what we value can change dramatically. So if we consider, say, the most valuable thing is there, say, it's our relationship with Krishna. And there are many things of value in life. So we could go from like this till V9, V10. So whatever we are value for a child, the toy may be the most valuable thing. And the toy breaks... Like the end of the world for the child. Now we may laugh, but actually for the child it's a catastrophe. So that's what they're valuing. So to even take one step upwards, two step upwards, or just one step from the previous one to the next, each of these takes time. So this is gradual purification. Whereas when we get mercy, we can just, it's like an elevator. Purification is gradually like one step, one step we take, we go by a staircase upwards. But when we get mercy, what we presently value and what we actually value, what is actual value, there might be a huge distance between that. But suddenly, we realize this is what really matters in life. So that is the mercy of Mahaprabhu. That when his magnanimity is what? That whatever it is that we may be valuing presently, which essentially determines the level of our consciousness, the level of our life. From there, we can rise to the highest value by His mercy. And in, in terms of this, par, this perspective or this visual, you can say, what is Mahaprabhu, this particular verse talking about the mercy? The first point it's saying is that if, say, somebody is right over here at the bottom, nothing is of value in life. That. What is the point even of living? So, agatya gatim natva. Right from here, a person can be elevated to the place where they will realize. 
that love for Krishna, living in a mood of service to Krishna, that is the highest value. On the other hand, somebody may be already at an elevated level. Dharma, Artha, Kama. If somebody is pursuing virtue, that's a person's good thing. If a person is pursuing uh, a responsible, a responsible a person is doing their job honorably, respectably, uh, then that is also a good thing. If a person is taking care of their family properly, that's also a good thing. So, but a person may already be elevated, but from wherever they are, from there also, they already have a high goal in life, relatively speaking, but from there they can get the highest goal. And even if somebody has liberation as their goal, even that they will transcend. So, in the past time of Sarva Bhuttacharya, it is Krishna Das Kauri Yosemite says that, uh, that Mahaprabhu liberated Sarvabhauma from the clutches of liberation. <laughs> so, in the Bhakti tradition, liberation is considered to be like a clutch. It's like it's considered to be a trap. Because in liberation, we may be free from distress, but there is no experience of love. There is no experience of the remembrance of Krishna, service to Krishna. And in that sense, even that is considered to be a deprivation. So he was liberated from liberation. That is the glorification of Kaivalya Nistarakau in the Shad Goswami Ashtakam. It is Kaivalya is liberation. It's the highest destination of the yogis and the jnanis. But Nistarakau, they deliver people from liberation. You deliver people from material existence. Why deliver somebody from liberation? Because even liberation is something which deprives the soul of the highest experience the soul is capable of. And that is love for Krishna. So this is the essence of mercy. That what we value presently and what is of actual value, that huge distance that might be there, that is bridged by mercy. Now when we get association of devotees, when we get to go to a holy place, when we get the opportunity to practice bhakti, that is mercy in the sense that we get glimpses of what is of higher value. For, for people who have never encountered anyone, anyone spiritually minded, anyone who is a, a saint or a monk or somebody who renounced the world, for them, they have, they have no idea that there is something of higher value beyond this world. If they have heard vaguely about them, they think, oh, these people are just, uh, just foolish people. Maybe they are failures in life, they are escapists, they just run away from the world. They may think like that. But actually they meet with a saintly person and they realize, hey, this person has something of... This person is so satisfied, so enriched. When Shila Prabhupada met Ambarish Prabhu for the first time, Alfred Ford is a great grandson of Henry Ford. So the devotees in themselves... Uh, Ambarish Prabhu is a very humble and sweet devotee. The devotees were in awe. They were introducing Prabhupada. Prabhupada, he's a great grandson of Henry Ford. And Prabhupada met him and Prabhupada was graceful, but Prabhupada also grave. Prabhupada said, So, you're the great grandson of Henry Ford? He said, Yes, Prabhupada. Where is he now? Now, so Ambarish Prabhu said that when I heard this, what Prabhupada meant was that okay, he accumulated all that wealth, but that wealth is left behind, he's gone somewhere else. Where is he now? What did he carry with him? He says, Prabhupada is a real saint. A real saint. Prabhupada is not here to flatter me to get some donation from me. Prabhupada is here to actually enlighten me. So what is of highest value? That, when we associate with saintly people, we are reminded of that. So if... If what we value does not change by association with devotees, by the practice of bhakti, then our, our association of devotees or even our practice of bhakti is actually very superficial. Somebody may come to a temple. Mm -hmm. One of my relatives, they came to the Juhu temple when I had just joined as a brahmachari. They had come to try to persuade me to not be a brahmachari. And then I was staying in one of the guest rooms at that time. And then they tried to talk with me. They didn't listen. And then, they, then after a couple of days, they called me. And they said, you know, actually, uh, I thought they would be angry because if you've come to persuade someone, that person doesn't listen to you. You may get angry with that person. I said, actually... Our visit to the temple was very productive. I said, really? He said, we had just moved to a new house and we were thinking what kind of furniture to get. So we saw the furniture in the guest house we were staying. We decided to get that kind of furniture. 
<laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, it's unfortunate that they didn't think of anything about Krishna. But at one level, that so if we come to Krishna and we continue to keep valuing the things that we value, then also it's good because we are connecting with Krishna and gradual purification will occur. But that is Bahunam Janmana Mante. That may take many lifetimes. If you see, what is, what is the difference in 7th chapter, Krishna talks about various kinds of people who approach him. And then, there are four kinds of people, Krishna says, who approach him. In Kali Yuga, there are four kinds of people who approach him. Those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed, and those who are distressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, people come, but what is the difference between those four categories mentioned in 716 and 719? The category Krishna calls as Mahatma. He says, Vasudeva Sarvamiti. The difference between those who come initially to Krishna and those who are Krishna considered Mahatmas is that for them Krishna becomes the highest value. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Now, how does this change occur? So, the first part I talked about is mercy. What is mercy? It's a change in our in, in what we value. Then how does this change occur? And how does Mahaprabhu provide this change or he stimulate or accelerate this change? So now generally this change occurs through broadly two things. There is intelligence. There is intelligence and then there is experience. We can use our intelligence to understand okay, what is of value. But experience is where we, where we ourselves either experience somebody who is in great joy or we ourselves experience some great joy, great peace, great fulfillment. And that is what completely realigns our inner world. So intelligence is more through the path of philosophy. We use our analysis. We, use, we study philosophy. Mahaprabhu also says that, or the Chaitanya Chaitanya says that, hearing is very important. Hearing is like the food for the soul, just as we have food for the body. And experience comes by the practice of bhakti. Now, philosophy is also a part of bhakti, but here specifically, bhakti pareshanubhava virakti ranyatracha. When we practice bhakti, then we get experience of Krishna. And para isha anubhav. Somebody may come to the temple, but when they come to the temple, they may just see, oh, these are decorated dolls. They don't experience Krishna. But if there's bhakti in the heart, and say, oh, this is the, this is the almighty Lord. This is, this is the ultimate benedictor and protector of my life. This is the person who is the ultimate purpose of my life. So that bhakti gives us experience of Krishna. So, with our intelligence, we understand there is something of higher value. But through the practice of bhakti, we experience something of higher value. And that keeps drawing us forward. That keeps drawing us upward. And now, th this process of using our intelligence and seeking higher experience. This is a time-honored process. But what Mahaprabhu does is Mahaprabhu, by his mercy gives very advanced spiritual experiences to even people who are not very qualified. Generally, the spiritual experiences, they come rarely. So, when we talk about spiritual experiences, it is across, the, across history and geography, there are different religious traditions, different theistic traditions, different wisdom traditions. They talk about people experiencing something higher. But this spiritual experience, it's almost like a black box. You know, what is inside it is like a mystery. In some traditions, in the Sufis, they have the Darvishas. People just keep whirling round and round and round and round and round. Like, as if never to get exhausted. What kind of energy do they have? In the Christian tradition, sometimes people have these... Uh, they are the passion of the Christ. The word passion has different meaning. For them, passion is that when they meditate on Jesus' sacrifice, when he was crucified, then similar bodily marks come on their body. So, in the Hindu tradition, there are sometimes people 
who seem to get possessed by gods and goddesses. And then they start dancing uh, wildly and they start uh, doing various kinds of things. And at that time, uh, sometime, uh, sometimes some people just start speaking in a different tongue, start speaking in a different tone. So there are experiences of the paranormal, of something beyond the normal. And these are often called as spiritual experiences. Now they may or may not be. But the idea is people sometimes experience something different from the normal. And now that is fine if somebody experiences something. One time one devotee came to Shri Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, Krishna came in my dream yesterday. And he was very excited. He was not a devotee actually, he was a life member. He was a person, he says, he says Prabhupada, Krishna came in my dream yesterday. And he was so excited. Prabhupada was completely nonchalant. All right, then serve him today. <laughs> 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 so, Prabhupada focused not on the content of the experience, but the impact of the experience. Anybody can claim, Krishna came to my dream. Anybody can claim that, oh, when I came to the temple, Krishna winked at me from the altar. You know, now is, can Krishna come in someone's dream? Can Krishna wink at someone? Well, who can stop Krishna from doing anything? But who can stop anyone from claiming that Krishna has done those things? So, the content is something which is, which is like a mystery. What is real, what is not real, that is very difficult to know. But there are two things. What we can know is the impact. If somebody has actually experienced Krishna, what will happen is that they will start valuing Krishna much more than anything else. That they will be pursuing Krishna wholeheartedly. So we don't know what the content of spiritual experiences is, but we don't know what the impact is. And if there is the impact, you know, Prabhupada, sometimes some devotees say that, you know, Mahaprabhu would go into ecstasy so much. But Prabhupada didn't seem to go so much into ecstasy. And Prabhupada said that preaching was ecstasy. And ecstasy is not just about how we experience joy. Ecstasy is about how we give Krishna joy. And when we give Krishna joy, naturally we also experience joy. So for Prabhupada, as a missionary, his focus was giving Krishna joy by getting souls to come, who are lost, to come toward Krishna. And in that Prabhupada experienced ecstasy. The impact was, even at an advanced stage, Prabhupada had more energy than his disciples who were often age of his grandchildren, not just his children. So that extraordinary energy, that extraordinary dedication was the indication that Prabhupada had some extraordinary higher experiences. So the impact is what is manifested in terms of a person's life. And then before that is the stimuli. Now we don't know what the internal of a spiritual experience is, but we know, we can say what are the external sources by which spiritual experiences can come. So, we come and behold the Lord, we hear his pastime, we participate in the kirtans, we do his seva. By all these, we are showing Krishna that Krishna, I value you. You are important for me. Your service is important for me. My mind may say, do this, do that, do that. But this is what is important for me. And when we focus on that, when we, we in a systematic, disciplined way, focus on devotional stimuli, that itself is an indication that we have started valuing Krishna. Because why would somebody in a disciplined way keep practicing bhakti? Either, either they're at least, at, if, uh, if they're not experiencing something directly, at least at the level of intelligence, they have started appreciating its value. And then, as long as we are exposing ourselves to devotional stimuli regularly, the experiences, the, tran the, the inner transformative experiences will come. And then the impact will manifest. The impact will manifest not just in ecstasy that breaks the normal routine of life. It can also manifest in increased dedication to the service of Krishna. So what does, Mah so in terms of this, we are again talking about Mahaprabhu's mercy. See, Mahaprabhu made the stimuli that give spiritual experience very richly available. Bhakti was already widely prevalent when Mahaprabhu was there in India. And Bhakti is a part of the Vedic literature. But what Mahaprabhu did was, he made bhakti much, much more accessible, much, much more 
easily available. Even the, if, if you see in the traditional Sri Vaishnava or Madhava Vaishnava traditions, Kirtan is a performance that accompanies Aarti. If you go in many South Indian temples, you'll see that. There's a pujari doing Aarti and there are some people who are singing along with it. And everybody folds hands and watches. So Kirtan was a performance to be beheld. Just like when the person, Pujari on the altar is doing Aarti, it's not that everybody else also starts doing Aarti. No, everybody else watches. <laughs> so just as Aarti is, a perf Aarti is a performance to be beheld. Similarly, Kirtan was also a performance to be beheld. But it is Mahaprabhu primarily who said, Kirtan is not just a performance to be, be, to be watched, it is to be participated in. That's why there is responsive Kirtans. And not just responsive kirtans, dancing kirtans. Bhakti was very much widely there. There are some saints who would dance in ecstasy, but it was rare. But Mahaprabhu said, but let everybody get access to the processes by which bhakti can be experienced in an intense and ecstatic way. So Mahaprabhu also traveled all over India and he broke down the various caste and other barriers that were there. And invited everyone to practice bhakti. So he made the stimuli very widely available. And Srila Prabhupada took it even further. And he made those stimuli available to everyone, practically in every part of the world. Now we have had devotees even going to Antarctica and distributing books over there. And now there are not many people in Antarctica to receive books. But at least... In principle, Prabhupada's mercy has gone to every continent on the planet now. Mahaprabhu's mercy, the, the sources, the stimuli that will reach to spiritual, lead to spiritual ecstasy, they being distributed widely, that itself is fortune. And that itself is mercy. But Mahaprabhu does something more than that. He not only gives the stimuli, but Krishna Askar Goswami says three things. He is Rupa, his bhava, <clears throat> and his karunya. His form, his form was majestically beautiful. It was, a, it was, it was like a golden mountain. He was, it was just uh, irresistibly attractive to look at. Rupa. And then there was his bhava. bhava. He himself was filled with so much ecstasy. And then on top of it is Karunya. It was not just his ecstasy was in relationship with the Lord. Mahap Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that love for God, when it is directed towards the Lord, it is manifested as absorption. That when we are beholding the Lord, we forget everything else. But at love for God, when it is manifested towards others, it is manifested as compassion. That is not that when we have to deal with others, we are lost in the Lord. No, we are attentive to help others come closer to Krishna. So his bhava was his absorption in the Lord, where he forgot everything else. But his karunya was, when he would travel across the country, who, anyone he would say, sthana, sthana, na dekhi, na dekhi, patra, patra. He would just embrace everyone and he would just infuse them with experiences of love for Krishna. And in this way, the, this what we talk about, not only the stimuli, but Mahaprabhu would accelerate the process by which they would get experiences and they would get the impact. They would get just completely transformed. Just forget everything else and just devote their life to the love for the Lord. So Mahaprabhu's mercy comes in both things. That we get the opportunity for spiritual stimuli and by which we realize there is something of higher value. And Mahaprabhu's mercy also comes in the form that in our capacity to actually start valuing the things that are of higher value. And this is, this is, these two have a relationship with each other. I'll conclude with this point and I'll talk about one past time which illustrates this point, which I'm making in the last, that Mahaprabhu, if we say his life had two distinct phases. In the first phase of his life, he was constantly traveling. And of course, first, uh, first phase of his life as a, as a devotee. Mahaprabhu started manifesting his bhakti from the age of 20. And then he was constantly 
inviting others to participate in kirtan when he traveled in across india north india south india that was this in one sense his preaching phase he was doing outreach and then there's that there was the outreach and we could say then there was the in reach in the last years of his life the last 18 years mahaprabhu was going deep into his relationship with krishna and he was experiencing and demonstrating the ultimate symptoms of ecstasy there are some transformations of the body like the the like say the signs of the crucifixion something appearing on people's bodies there are transformations of spiritual ecstasy talked about in various various religious traditions but the kind of transformation that mahaprabhu is would manifest sometimes in ecstasy it appeared as if his arms had become so long that they had almost the bones had become disconnected and they were being held together only by the skin now the gaudiya commentators explain that why would this kind of transformation happen and mahaprabhu would feel separation from krishna at that time he would long for krishna and then spread his arms apart as wide and as far as the way he could go now depend his his ajanu lambit he was already very long arms were there but still he would feel krishna is so far away and stretching out for krishna what would happen is his arms would become so long that it appears as if they were they were, dis- they were disconnected from his body so his limbs would become even longer and longer and sometimes his limbs would shrink into his body and that was when he would experience the presence of krishna at that time he wanted to be so immersed in the experience of krishna that all the senses would feel just like distractions so if i if we want to hear something and then we touch some we put our hand on the ground it's too cold then we move somewhere it's too hot yes, this is annoying i don't want to touch anywhere it's for to focus on hearing so sometimes if our senses are giving us some sensations that are distracting us from what we focus on we just don't want anything to do with the senses so like if we are tasting something delicious and somebody wants to talk with us later i want to eat right now just taste something delicious and sometimes it's very delicious we want to close our eyes you know i don't want to see anything just feel the taste of this so like that for mahaprabhu when he would feel the proximity and the presence of krishna he would be in such ecstasy that i don't want to experience anything else and that's how all his limbs would withdraw into his body that no limb should be out causing any distraction so like there's the transformation that mahaprabhu would exhibit are extraordinary and by that also while he was experiencing it himself he was also demonstrating this to others and as demonstrating this to others he was giving them also a spiritual experience so spiritual experiences can come when we ourselves experience krishna but they can also come when we behold someone else experiencing krishna and being extraordinarily transformed so mahaprabhu in the later part of his life it's it might seem that he was not doing any outreach but he was there's one form of outreach is to help people understand okay give up your dharma give up your adharma just practice bhakti but it is here this is prema bhakti vadanyata in this particular verse that we discussed it said that vadanyata at one level to give bhakti give the opportunity for practicing bhakti itself is generosity but beyond that to demonstrate prema to demonstrate the ecstasy of love of god that is even greater mercy and this mercy is multiple levels and layers of mercy mahaprabhu demonstrated in the ratha yatra pastime so this is a very profound pastime and i'll try to describe this briefly to demonstrate how mahaprabhu was uh, mahaprabhu transformed his ratha yatra festival into a festival of the highest devotional ecstasy that was accessible and relishable for everyone so you could say traditionally in the ratha yatra festival there were three elements there was jagannath on his, lord jagannath on his rath hmm? then around him we could say there are the devotees hmm? and then there are the common pious people who also come in thousands hmm? the pious people now in one sense there are three levels of interaction happening between the devotees and the lord 
the devotees are beholding the lord they are relishing the lord's beauty they are in the internal mood of the past time shall come to shortly then there is also the reciprocation between the people in general and the lord hmm. and there is the reciprocation between the devotees and the people if the devotees are absorbed in krishna in ecstasy and what would happen is people would see that hey this is something special something extraordinary so this was the rathyatra festival was happening for a very long time and this reciprocation between the lord and the devotees between the common people and the with lord and the common people and the devotees this was always happening and in fact in any 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 devotional festival these three reciprocations are there when we say we have janmashtami or we have ram navmi people come to behold the lord but what makes the special festival special is if they behold devotees who are devoted to the lord who are in ecstasy hey that that's something special you to see that but when mahaprabhu came what happened was what happened was something much much bigger so we have let's put we have we have lord jagannath of course jagannath baldev subhadra let's put lord jagannath over here lord jagannath is krishna and then we have mahaprabhu mm -hmm. now then we have devotees and then we have people in general so now there are multiple levels of divine reciprocation happening now we could say mahaprabhu at one level is in the role of a devotee so mahaprabhu as devotee is reciprocating with lord jagannath but there is much is not mahaprabhu not just devotee actually jagannath jagannath is krishna separated from radharani no krishna we know the story of how the lord form of jagannath manifested that when krishna in first time it manifested that when krishna was when the when the dwarka vasis wanted to hear about krishna leela and they asked rohin to speak about it and krishna was secretly hearing and krishna became so absorbed that his eyes opened wide and his limbs shrunk in and then he manifested jagannath so jagannath is krishna remembering rajivasis and rajivasis ultimately is the topmost rajivasi is radharani so it's krishna remembering radharani and separated from radharani and mahaprabhu is radharani separated from krishna mahaprabhu is of course krishna but krishna in the mood of radharani and radharani longing for krishna aidina dayadranath he mathura nath kadav lokke se that oh lord now you are the lord of the fallen people you are the lord of your devotees but you have left us all and have gone to mathura you have become the mathura nath now what am i going to do where am i how am i going to live so mahaprabhu is radharani in the mood of separation from krishna so actually in rathyatra it was not just devotees beholding the lord and rejoicing with the lord it was actually the union of radha and krishna that was happening so when mahaprabhu was dancing and sometimes jagannath's cart would stop because jagannath wanted to behold jagannath is krishna wanting to behold radharani and so this is the ultimate culmination of ras leela that happened ras leela there is the whole past time where they where they come together talk then krishna disappear then they come again together they dance it's extraordinary past time the culmination of that is the union of radha and krishna so that's what happening in ras in the in the jagannath festival also now while mahaprabhu is the is in the mood of radha rani for jagannath for devotees mahaprabhu is their lord so here between devotees and mahaprabhu there is another reciprocation there is for the, for him it is chetan chetan was that there was there was there were two divines over there there was the moving lord and the non moving lord moving non moving means there was jagannath who was not manifestedly moving and chetan mahaprabhu was moving so for them now the, the earlier interaction i said they were always there hmm? these interaction there but this was the devotees were beholding mahaprabhu and when they were beholding mahaprabhu mahaprabhu would frequently go into ecstasy but the kind of ecstasy would be there in in the jagannath yatra would be unparalleled and they would be thrilled they would be ex they would be amazed and generally mahaprabhu's ecstasies were exhibited in private 
either at night when he was all alone with Sarod Damodar or Shankar Pandit or somebody like that, he would exhibit his ecstasies. But at the time of Rath Yatra, his ecstasies were exhibited for everyone to see. So because of that, even ordinary people got the dis exhibition of, got the demonstration, got the darshan of Mahaprabhu in that mood of ecstasy. So Mahaprabhu, in one sense, the devotees who were already dedicated to the practice of bhakti, he was giving them the experience of prema, the highest ecstasy. And for those who were just pious, he was showing them the ecstasy of love of God and he was increasing their faith. He was elevating them higher. And of course, the other interaction with people and devotees were also there. But in this way, Mahaprabhu was both experiencing Krishna, and he was savoring Krishna, and he was sharing Krishna. He was sharing Krishna with the devotees, he was sharing Krishna with the pious people in general. And in this way, he was elevating everyone. And we could speak much more about this pastime. But the point is that there are, there are multiple levels of loving reciprocation that were happening. And it was not that Mahaprabhu was just in his own world not caring for everyone else. At that time, during Mahaprabhu's time, historians of Bengal and of Indian religion say that the Ratyatra festival attained heights like never before during Mahaprabhu's time. During those 17, 18 years when Mahaprabhu was there, that time the Ratyatra, th thousands and thousands and millions and millions of people would come and they would behold Mahaprabhu and they would become spiritually inspired by that. And that same ecstasy, Srila Prabhupada, in the Antarila of Jachatan Charita Amrit, when he speaks about, when Mahaprabhu is experiencing ecstasy, and he's talking about the mood of separation from Radharani, of, of Radharani separation from Krishna, and longing for Krishna, and Prabhupada writes in the purports that the way to enter Radha Krishna's pastimes is by spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. Now, some people say, hey, this is, this is, this is Rasavas, what is going on? Here there are intimate parts of Radha and Krishna and then we are supposed to go and tell people you are not the body or the soul. You know, where is the Rasa over here? Actually, the Rasa is in pleasing Krishna. It is not that Mahaprabhu was experiencing ecstasy because he was with Krishna. Yes, it was with Krishna, but Mahaprabhu experienced ecstasy because he was pleasing Krishna. And Prabhupada took that responsibility. So somebody may say, I have faith in Mahaprabhu. He is Krishna. Yeah, that's wonderful. But if he's Krishna, then his prophecy is going to come true. And a devotee may say, yeah, he's his God. His prophecy is going to come true. Prabhupada says, and Krishna did not tell Arjuna. Arjuna did not tell Krishna. Krishna, you told me you are God. So now you only win this war. I'll just sit and relax. No, Krishna, Arjuna said, I will do your will. So like that Prabhupada, he knew Krishna, Mahaprabhu is God. But Prabhupada took the responsibility of sharing, of sharing Mahaprabhu's legacy, of fulfilling Mahaprabhu's desire. Prutvite Yacheta Nagaradi Gram, Sarvatra Pachar Hoi Bimuranam. That my name will be chanted in every town and play, village in the world. When Mahaprabhu came to Varanasi, he said, I brought, Kashi, he said, I brought so many fruits of love of God, but there's nobody to take them. But nobody is buying them, so I'll give them free. But I have so many fruits that I cannot even give them free. So please assist me in giving these fruits of love of God. Oh, that is Vadanyata. So Prabhupada took that responsibility of distributing the fruits of love of God. And for us, we may or may not experience ecstasy when we take darshan or when we do puja. Uh, and yes, we will also experience ecstasy at times and those times will also increase as we keep practicing bhakti. But for us, if we try to share Krishna bhakti with others, then therein we will see wonderful things happening. Wonderful things happening and how people become transformed by their contact with Krishna. Wonderful things happening in our own hearts. How we feel inspired, how we become enriched. And that is also an experience of Krishna. So, from where we are, we want to rise higher. And Prabhupada is saying that the way we rise higher is by learning to value Krishna enough 
to want to share krishna with others and when we do that we will reach out not only outward to people and give them krishna but we also reach inward to krishna and connect more and more with him so this is the mercy of mahaprabhu which the prabhu pad has given and which we all can ourselves relish and we can also distribute to others so i'll summarize i spoke broadly three main points today the first point i spoke was about mercy as as elevating our values our understanding of what is of values so <clears throat> we all value certain things in life and mahaprabhu described that those who have no goal he becomes their goal those who already have goals he becomes their highest goal so this change in our values it takes time slowly rising our value every impurity means it misaligns what we value with what is of actual value and purification means that realignment happens so this is incremental process like a climbing up a staircase but by mahaprabhu's mercy if we can get an elevator we can rapidly what we value can change and align with what is of value and the second part i discussed was about spiritual experiences so spiritual experiences basically this change of values it can happen either through intelligence where we philosophically understand and through experiencing krishna through the practice of bhakti now with respect to spiritual experiences that what actually happens within it's unknown nobody else can know and people can claim what they want but what we can look at is the impact the impact should be that a person who has had a spiritual experience should be valuing krishna more than anything else and the way we can seek that experiences by valuing the stimuli and exposing ourselves to the stimuli in a disciplined regular way now now mahaprabhu you could say first level of mercy is that he gives us access to the stimuli itself mahaprabhu transform kirtan from a performance to a participation prabhu pad gave the opportunity for kirtan to everyone all over the world so access to the stimuli itself if we consider the spiritual experience there is the stimuli and there is the impact and by mahaprabhu's mercy the impact also becomes faster that happens by his rupa his bhava and his karunya by his beauty by his ecstasy and by his magnanimity and the last part we discussed is that how this reciprocation of love between the lord and the devotees uh, that can happen at many 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 different ways at different places so the rath yatra there was mahaprabhu reciprocating with the lord mahaprabhu reciprocating with devotees and mahaprabhu also reciprocating with the people in general apart from the devotees reciprocating with the lord people reciprocating with the lord and devotees reciprocating with people so for us the way we connect with the lord more deeply that we we see we of course practice bhakti and we connect with krishna deeply but when we try to connect others with krishna when we try to share mahaprabhu's mercy with others as shri prabhupad did so tirelessly and so fearlessly even in his old age then the more we try to do outreach the more krishna himself will do in reach krishna will reach out to us and then we will experience the transformation by which what we value will start aligning with what is of ultimate value and that is the mercy of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments yes mata ji we have mic yeah hare krishna thank you so much for the class prabhu ji um I was wondering if you could explain how offenses block our ability to see what is of highest value. Okay, how do offenses block our capacity to see what is of highest value? See, in general, an offense itself is an indication. In general, offense itself is an indication that we are devaluing something of value. That means, see, that's generally if we are ignorant. then it is it is said that we are not offensive that's why there is there is uh, naam aparad the offense to the holy name of occurs when somebody knows the glory of the holy name and neglects it 
But if we don't know about the glory of the holy name, and then we chant it in a inattentive or a, in a disrespectful way, that's not considered an offense. So generally, when we know something is of value and we devalue it, in spite of that knowledge, that is when it's an offense. And then Krishna says, despite knowing is you don't value it, then I will take away your appreciation of its value. So that's why what happens is when Krishna takes away that appreciation of its value, it could be an, that intelligence can be lost or just the taste can be lost. And when that happens, then it's almost like a free fall. That we just fall from wherever, whatever elevated state we might have been before to whatever, wherever our conditionings would have kept us in the past. So basically, our sense of valuation, if we, deva if we, we devalue something of value, then Krishna will take away that sense of, sense of value itself for us, that appreciation of its value, both in terms of our intelligence and our taste. And that's how that is. offense is in that sense uh, quite dangerous. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hi, Krishna. Yesterday in Buddha Bhavana's uh, purpose class, he actually also mentioned value and he said that value is synonymous to faith. Can you comment on this and how it's relating to what you are speaking today? Okay, value is synonymous to faith. Yes, we could say that faith is uh, basically our value system. Shraddha mayoyam purusho yayach shraddha sa eva saha. That Krishna says that we are all made of our faith. Shraddha mayoyam purusho. In the 17th chapter, Krishna says that what constitutes, what defines a person is their faith. Sometimes we use the anand mayo abhyasa. The soul is filled with joy. But here Krishna says that is true. But here anand, here says shraddha mayoyam purusho. That we are actually made of faith. What that means is that our faith Faith determines the choices that we will make. Our faith determines the kind of goals we will pursue. So it's just, uh, if I have faith that, uh, if I have faith in money, then to earn money, I'll go to any extreme. Mm -hmm. If I have faith in, some people say, say, in the communist rule, people had great faith in the government. That the government had become the substitute for God for people. So for the sake of the government, people were even ready to betray their family members. Betray their, you know, it is said that every third person was a, like a Soviet spy. So you speak one thing against the government, somebody in your family might be an informer for the government. So what would that mean? Their faith in the government was greater than their faith in the family. So basically, faith is very much associated with our values. Uh, now, in one sense, now, when we talk about values, there could be like a rational values. Rational means rationally I understand this is important. But faith is it's almost like a not non-rational, but a trans-rational trans value system. That is, I don't need any reason to consider this to be important. Now, there are some things which we will never do. Even if somebody gives you a rational explanation, that's all right. Why, why don't you do it? You know, there is a, there's an increasing propaganda now in Europe that people should start taking, eating insects. Like now there are, there, it's actually, they say insects are very eco-friendly. Well, it's definitely not friendly for the insects <laughs> themselves. <laughs> they are going to die. But bread and pasta and all this is made using ground insects. Now, now there is most people, they revolted the idea. I can't eat insects. But what? There is a paper published in, in a prominent scientific journal. How to persuade people to start eating insects. Now, now we may say that, okay, there is, there is, a, there is, there is some eco-friendly value, there is that, there are so many proteins in this, proteins in that. So many. Prabhupada said, even human refuse has nutrition. But that doesn't mean you're going to eat human refuse. Isn't it? There, there are certain things we don't need a reason to say no to. No, I'm not going to do it. So, now that, that is not irrational. It, some things could be irrational, but there is something, we all have certain boundaries we will not violate. That is, so faith is about that valuation which is transrational. So, it's, I value certain things even if I can't with reason explain why this is so important for me. So, faith, faith is like a transnational values. 
Does that answer your question? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Chancellor Prabhu, for this wonderful class. Uh, I would like to share my experience here in this wonderful movement, ISKCON movement. I found something which is, I might say, that is more merciful than the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. is mercy of devotees. Mm -hmm. And I can say that sometimes I come to this temple room and I see lots of people they're standing while its curtain is going and they're not joining them even here is in the temple but uh, when we s have a chance to uh, serve a devotee we receive this uh, mercy from from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from Prabhupada and it's amazing uh, that's what I would like to say that mercy of serving for those who want, who experience this uh, mercy from Chaitanya Prabhu, even more merciful, you know, it's, who is making this impact in this, uh, in, this, uh, True. Uh, in this world. So thank yes. you, sorry if we heard. Yes, definitely. He said that, you know, Mahaprabhu spread Krishna consciousness in Bengal and Orissa and South India. Prabhupada spread all over the world. And without that Prabhupada is greater than Mahaprabhu, but by Mahaprabhu's mercy, he wants his devotees to be glorified. So yes. Krishna's mercy, Mahaprabhu's mercy often becomes more accessible through his devotees. Thank you. Yes, please. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Thank you very much for the enlightening talk. Uh, is it, um, I would like to ask you whether to see others' good qualities and to focus on one's own bad qualities is recommended to invoke to be recipient for the mercy of the Lord. Okay, is it, rec rec is it recommended to focus on others' good qualities and our bad qualities to receive mercy? Well, it depends. The principle is amanina manadena, that we should respect others. And respecting others means looking at their good qualities. And amani means not that we start disrespecting ourselves, it's that, uh, it's that we don't we are not constantly craving for respect. So now we all have, everybody has some good qualities, some bad qualities. And that includes we and others. So generally looking at others' good qualities is very good. And that, is, that will help us to respect them. Now with respect to ourselves, it depends on our state of mind. So generally we think that We often think that the opposite of opposite of humility is ego. So if I want to avoid ego, then I will ego means to think how great I am. And I want to be humble, so I'll avoid ego. But actually, rather than thinking of these as two things, the opposite of ego is not humility, it is insecurity. It is inferiority. Hmm? And these two Ego is to think I am far bigger than I am, what I actually am. And insecurity is thinking I am far smaller than what I am. Ego means to think I am everything. I can do everything. Insecurity means I am nothing. I can do nothing. But in between these two, the balance of the pendulum is humility. That I am something. I am a part of Krishna and I can do some things. I can play my part in Krishna's plan. So... When we dwell on our bad qualities, if we are in this direction of, if, if, if our inner self-conception is, is going towards the ego side, then to bring it here, it's uh, contemplate our negatives. Contemplate our bad qualities, our deficiencies. You know, people may think I am so great. But you know, I can't, I can't do this, I can't control my senses, I can't do this, I can't do that. That will bring, that will keep us humble. But if we are going towards insecurity, we are feeling worthless, we are feeling what is the, we are feeling hopeless. We are becoming so disheartened that we just don't feel like practicing bhakti, feel like doing anything in life. Then if you are going this direction, we have to contemplate our good qualities. Not in the sense of being self-congratulatory, but in the sense that you know, Krishna values me, Krishna has given me some gifts also. And I can use them in Krishna's service. 
there's and prabhupad also in his different letters exhibits these different things one time one devotee wrote to prabhupad prabhupad i want to assist you in saving fallen souls all over the world and prabhupad wrote back you know first one should save oneself <laughs> I don't think that you know that if I go to save the whole world, first say so. If somebody is having a too high self conception, bring it down a little bit. First save yourself. And uh, another devotee wrote a letter to Prabhupada. I am such a fallen soul. What can I do in your glorious mission? And Prabhupada wrote back, I need many fallen souls like you to save the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> so Prabhupada is appreciating that, <laughs> appreciating that devotee. so it depends on our state of mind see it's like sometimes it's good to look at ourselves the way we would look at somebody we care for hmm is look at ourselves from a third person perspective so if somebody has come to us and they are just they are just putting on air they are bloated they are egoistic then it may be our duty as their guide as their friends to bring them a notch down but if they are already discouraged then that is not the time we have to teach them humility It's the time we have to give them encouragement. We have to boost their morale. So it depends. Sometimes our limitations, our deficiencies, our bad qualities, contemplating them can be helpful. But the point is not so much whether I am contemplating my good qualities or contemplating my bad qualities. The key point is whether I am contemplating Krishna and my service to Krishna. And for my service to Krishna, sometimes remembering my good qualities can be helpful. And sometimes remembering my limitations can be helpful. so if we focus on krishna then focus on service to krishna then we can have a healthy appropriate relationship with ourselves okay okay yeah, Prabhuji, uh, is it okay to ask one more question okay thank you so much um you kindly said offenses block mercy please forgive me for asking second question uh, so if offenses block mercy how can we nullify sins can be nullified by devotional services but how can we nullify offenses see ultimately krishna doesn't want to keep us away from him krishna wants to wants us to give up the things that keep us away from him so if offense is essentially <coughs> devaluing something of value then the way to correct offense is to start revaluing it that's why if we offended a devotee we go and seek forgiveness from that devotee so what is that? it's not just an external act of forgiveness that is important what is that i devalued you i'm sorry i'm not going to devalue you anymore i value you enough and that's why i'm seeking forgiveness from you so if if krishna sees that we have started valuing what is of value at least according to our level of realization then krishna won't uh, keep us against uh, keep, hold our past offenses against him so generally it begins with seeking forgiveness from whichever manifestation of krishna that we have devalued if it's a devotee we 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 seek forgiveness from the devotees but we shouldn't worry too much about offenses because it's like one devotee i had gone to one place and he said that you know he he used to come for classes and he so he sit right in front front and he would hear the class and i was there for 3 4 days i guess 6 7 class i didn't come for a single class then i messaged him and he said bro i cannot come for any class but i can come and meet you if you want i said okay sure please come He says, "What happened? Why are not coming for any class? I know anything. You lost interest in bhakti, or what happened?" He says, "No, no, bhakti is very important." He said, "Then what happened?" He says, "I came. Yes, before you came, there was some devotee who gave a class on how dangerous Vishnu aparad is. So I thought that in order to avoid Vishnu aparad, I'll stop going in the association of Vishnu only. <laughs> 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 Then I will never commit any offence." <laughs> Uh, uh, no that is i told you that's like suppose somebody hear some talk about how dangerous food poisoning is and their solution is i'll stop eating food only <laughs> that's not the solution we have to be careful of the food we eat not that we stop eating food so sometimes what happens is if one point is emphasized too much don't commit offenses don't commit offenses they're so dangerous so we might make that avoiding offense the most important thing in our spiritual life now our most important thing in spiritual life is connecting with krishna serving krishna and for that association of devotees is important so krishna is not going to hold some incidental offenses against us the real serious offenses are where we knowingly intentionally devalue a devotee 
if if somebody is you know sometimes we we displease someone we hurt someone incidentally circumstantially because of our limitations that's okay but knowingly we malign someone we try to pull someone down we try to spread rumors about someone that is where that is a serious offenses okay thank you okay last question from stop please Hare Krishna Prabhu, thanks yes. so much for the great class. Um, I was just wondering about something. So you were mentioning about um, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was uh, displaying ecstatic symptoms, sometimes he was longing out, reaching out f uh, for Krishna, and sometimes he was experiencing Krishna within himself. So I was just wondering, a lot of times um, we hear, like we have that mood of uh, longing out for Krishna, wanting to connect with Krishna uh, outside. And we see that a lot of times in our in the acharyas as well, but we don't we don't really put much emphasis on experiencing Krishna within ourselves, seated right within us. So I was wondering if that's something we can also meditate on, um, also maybe in our chop or something like that. Um, yeah, what's your thoughts on that? So experiencing Krishna within us, we don't emphasize that too much. Yeah, it's oftentimes it's, it's more like a longing and reaching out to uh, reach out to Krishna rather than experiencing Krishna well, right within us. It's a it's not necessarily reaching out is only in a like a physical sense. And sometimes people say that heaven is up. You know? But people all over the earth say heaven is up. Now, in India people say heaven is up. In America people say heaven is up. If you look at the earth is circular. So heaven is up, heaven is up. Where is up? <laughs> is it? it? <laughs> so that up is not a geographical up. Hmm? It's more of a consciousness wise up. Hmm? So, the spiritual world exists at a higher level. Not just of a higher uh, level of physical reality, but a higher level of consciousness. So, when you're talking about reaching out to Krishna, it is not just outward, it can also be inward. Inward Krishna is there close to us, but still we are not perceiving him, so he's far away from us. So, actually, it is Krishna's external manifestations that remind us of Krishna, that reconnect us with Krishna. And the more we expose ourselves to Krishna's external manifestations, the more we start becoming aware of his presence inside us also. Now broadly, there are three ways in which we connect with Krishna. Or, or Traditionally, or because it's not Krishna, people have sought God in three broad ways. One is the religious ways where people focus on worship and uh, practices by which they focus on the external manifestations of the Lord. Then there is the, the psychological or internal meditational way where people focus on meditation and they try to turn inwards. And there is the cosmic or the natural way where people go close to nature, focus on the universe. And then in, that is the, that, that manifestation is talking about the universal form of God. Universal form is the second kind of Bhagavatam talks about. So all three are ways which are included in the Bhagavatam. Now, we primarily approach Krishna through the Bhakti way, but we can see Krishna in nature also. When Prabhupada would go on morning walks, he would talk about seeing Krishna there. We also see. If, so if we, we personally are inclined to focus on Krishna in our hearts, not at the expense of our normal Bhakti practice which connect with Krishna externally, but some people may be more introspective and they can focus on that also. That's also wonderful. Okay. So, thank you very much. Yes. So... Now, this is uh, Chaitanya Charitamrut uh, marathon is going on all over the world this time. And devotees are distributing lots of books of the entire Chaitanya Charitamrut set. And Chaitanya Charitamrut is a literature that is not so well known, but that is an opportunity for us to distribute. Because we distribute Bhagavad Gita, many people already say, I have Bhagavad Gita. But if you try to distribute Chaitanya Charitamrut, not many people are going to say, I already have Chaitanya Charitamrut. So that's an advantage for us and it's an extraordinary treasure of literature, of devotion, of art. So on the occasion of Mahaprabhu's appearance day, it's a, if, if you don't have CC, you can have it, you can distribute it to your friends, gift it or inspire them to take it. That's a great opportunity to share the mercy of Mahaprabhu far and wide through distributing the Chaitanya Charita Amrath. Would you like to talk about it? Hare Krishna. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu Ki. Yeah. So just, just let you know. I